All right, let's try that again. I won't touch anything. <laughs> oh, is it the connection? Is that why? Yeah, the connection just died. I don't know why. This is a landline. Anyway. Oh, okay. So we're just asking if you're okay to be recorded for our transcript. Just oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I assume right, awesome. everything okay. is recorded. So, so the first question that we have for you, what has led you or what started your belief into the Flat Earth Society? Uh, and just so you know, it's it's not the Flat Earth Society. We have nothing to do with the old school version. Um, if Flat Earth was software, we we would be Flat Earth 2.0 that basically relies on social media more than anything else. Uh, the old Flat Earth Society, we don't even talk to them. They don't have anything to do with the conferences. And uh, But anyway, to answer your question, how, how, did we get in, how did I get into this? I got into this uh, in 2014 because I was looking at a whole bunch of other conspiracies and uh, was basically just bored. And it's like, ah, Flat Earth, I'll take a look at that. It's stupid and nobody really cares about it. Thought I could just shut it down in a weekend. And then nine months later, I realized I couldn't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. So I decided to make a series of videos in 2015 uh, called Flat Earth Clues. Put them out on the internet, and it seemed to resonate with a whole bunch of people. So that's where we are. So you said, which I thought was very interesting, that it's more of a flat Earth society 2.0 than the original. Um, and oh. you said something about the social media and like the popularity for it. Would you say that that overrules the scientific claims? Like, what scientific claims, or what science supports those claims that you have? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, if you, if you're looking for the my my best proofs as far as you know why why it's resonated, why flat Earth just won't go away, um, the top five are uh, the first one would be long distance photography, which is we can now see with HD technology and HD cameras, we can say see way further than what should be possible because of the curvature of the Earth. Uh, the second one would be gravity versus the vacuum of space which is okay where you, you know you're breathing an atmosphere right now it's 80 percent nitrogen and 20 percent oxygen what's holding it down to the ground why hasn't it been ripped off by the massive vacuum of space and you say well it's gravity and i come back and i say okay let's just do a quick little thought experiment let's say you you're in a building right now and you have a second floor and you make that second floor a vacuum chamber you put a cork in the ceiling you pop that cork what's going to happen 100 times out of 100 the air is going to equalize very very quickly uh and violently and my and you're saying what's your point my point is why didn't gravity keep it in the room that you're in right now and then you're kind of stuck science has nowhere to go with that third thing would be the eclipse shadow the eclipse shadow is too small if the moon is 2,000 miles wide why is the eclipse shadow on the ground only 70 miles wide and they say, well, it condenses kind of like a lens. And it's like, oh, really? Because we say the moon is really only 50 miles wide anyway, so it matches up way better with ours. Uh, on the ground down here, uh, shadows never get smaller. They are always actual size or larger. And, uh, and you say, oh, well, you know, it's that whole convex thing which science talks about. I go, okay, same, fine, the same thing should work for the moon. So if the Earth is 8,000 miles wide, then the blackout zone on the moon, there should be this giant black dot that crosses it about 250 miles wide. We never, ever see it. Uh, fourth would be the moon temperature, which I, which I love, even though it doesn't prove a flat Earth in any capacity, uh, which is the moon light generates a cold laser light that you could measure with a $20 thing, point and click thermometer you pick up at any hardware store, uh, up to 13 degrees Fahrenheit swing. And what I mean by that is it's warmer in the moon shade than it is in the moonlight, which is the exact opposite of the sun absolutely mind-boggling does it prove a flat earth no but it absolutely destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon meaning the moon is basically its own light source it doesn't reflect anything from the sun it's simulated oh okay and okay uh, so last but not least would be the van allen radiation belts which is a trap question which i came up with a few years ago which is are there van allen radiation belts which were announced by nasa in, in the 1950s are they deadly yes or no and if you say, yes, they are deadly, then how did the Americans make multiple round trips through them in the late 1960s with no shielding whatsoever? The only thing that can stop radiation is lead, gold, and a whole bunch of water. They didn't use any of those for the capsule. Nobody died. Nobody uh, got radiation poisoning. Nobody even got cancer. There's still five of them walking around today. They all died of natural causes. And you say, well, okay, they're, no, they're not deadly then. 
I come back and I say, well, no, because NASA made a video at the end of 2014 saying it's called a Ryan trial by fire, saying they're really deadly. And they can't even test their Mars program capsules because they haven't figured out how to solve the radiation problem. And it's like, uh, what are you talking about? You solved them perfectly back in the 1960s, absolutely flawlessly. And what, what happened? Did, what changed between then and now? So between those five questions, I posed those five questions to a Georgetown physicist. Uh, I don't know, about 18 months ago. And he, because he wanted to do a debate, and that was it. He just closed up shop, said, nope, done. And we never ran the segment. Wow. Okay. So going back to what you were saying about the moon, yeah. do you believe the other planets and the moon and the sun are, in fact, spherical? No, no. Well, I mean, they look spherical, but only from a, an appearance standpoint. No different than a, a video game. Like, I don't know what you guys play, but I mean, do the planets up in the sky in Fortnite look spherical? Yeah, of course they do. That's because they're drawn They're drawn that way. Would you go to a planetarium, and I know you guys probably aren't even old enough to, to go to planetariums, because uh, nobody goes anymore. They're super boring. But when you look up, you see the moon and Jupiter and Mars. and So, like, if you go to a planetarium, you look and you see Jupiter. Does Jupiter look spherical? Yes. Can you land on it? No. Why not? It's like, well, because it's just a pretty image on the ceiling. And that's all what I'm saying that the planets are. I mean, yeah, the planets look spherical, but really they're just some really attractive clock system that was designed for us a long time ago before we even had the inkling to make clocks. Because that's all really the sky is. It's just a, a, a really intricate clock system that can be understood by any language in any culture. So we can't land on it because... Because it's not, it's not there. There's nothing, there's nothing to land on. Uh, can you land if you're, if you're looking at a, a picture of, a, 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 you know, put throw a high def image of the moon on your television screen? Looks real, right? Can you land on it? No. Why not? Well, because it's a 2D image that just appears 3D. That's all we're really talking about here. We're talking about a giant projection system. Now, some people have said, well, the moon might be three dimensional. It's like, yeah, maybe. But I don't think you, I still don't think you can land on it. That even even best case scenario, you're talking about an object that would be less than 50 miles wide and would be self illuminated. And who knows what the physics are when you get up there? But it's not. But it's definitely not 237 thousand miles away. It's only I don't know at most 3,000, give or take. And you would say like the picture making it seem curved because of the uh, the wide angle lens which makes the earth seem curved when it was not oh yeah yeah the, well yeah if you want to you want to get into that you know why why does why when you look at photos and images from nasa why does it look curved oh yeah wide angle lens otherwise known as a fisheye lens otherwise known as a peephole lens i like i don't know why people go with the fisheye lens because the, the peephole thing makes way more sense because everyone's looked through a peephole at least once in their life when you're in a hotel room you look through a peephole in your door and the hallway is curved, but you know full well the hallway is perfectly straight. So why is it curved when you look through it? It's because of the lens. Um, lenses can do, you know, ask anybody who, who's in the entertainment industry. You can do all sorts of fun things with lenses. And Hollywood figured that out uh, a long time ago and NASA picked up on it, you know, as soon as they were founded in 1958. A lot of, um, to go back to space in general, I know the one topic in debate according to flat earthers that it seems like um is a stationary earth what are your thoughts on that do you think that oh yeah yeah, yeah. well well the, the, no that's a good question and which is it's you gotta remember the reinforcement that we have had our entire lives you know I'm, I'm older than you guys but it's been there forever and that is that you live in this vast empty universe and the earth is this tiny little rock flying through an impossibly empty place what we're saying is there is no space i mean you could be basically living in a box that's sitting on a lab desk and everything, the sky is just a simulation. The sky is an illusion. So there doesn't have to be space. Space doesn't exist because why would it? If 99.9% .9 of the people believe in the illusion, then you don't need anything else. It's, it's a waste of resources. You don't have to build an entire solar system or a universe. We're talking about basically we're living in a snow globe, a pizza box. Um, uh, a Hollywood soundstage. So. So, then how are we able to track weather? You know, through satellites or 
through. Oh no no no! I'm, I, and I'm not saying there aren't satellites, but if you want to have some fun, and it's this is none of the stuff I, I I came up with in the clues and any other research that everyone's doing. None of it's secret. Look up the high altitude balloon programs, the satellite balloons from that NASA has been doing ever since they were founded in the 1950s. Do you know that NASA is the world's largest consumer of helium? And do you know why? Because they launch balloons literally every day um, with payloads, with satellites up to four tons. That's 8,000 pounds. And there's videos of these things, you know, when they go horribly wrong and crash into cars. Uh, there are satellites flying around there, sure. And can they track weather? Sure. Do you need, ge you know, do they have geostationary uh, satellites that are hovering at 3,000 miles? Doubtful. Uh, do most of the satellites handle most of the bandwidth? No, and everybody knows that in media. Almost all of the bandwidth, even the bandwidth you and I are talking right now, is all fiber optic cables that have been laid for years and years. Fiber optics have been around since the late 70s. And we started laying those cables really, really quickly in undersea. And they that handles most of the bandwidth. Can you do some stuff with satellites? Sure. But if it's pennies on the dollar, why in the heck would you launch a satellite on a rocket when you can just do it on a balloon? And, and NASA has been really quiet about that. Uh, but I, in fact, I talked to a guy down in Australia who worked on that program. And, you know, he, he you know even admitted on camera that, oh, yeah, we send up balloons all the time. In fact, look at look up if you get a chance. Look up on YouTube when satellites crash somewhere, wherever you know, whatever neighborhood they crash in, they're always te tethered to a balloon. They don't come down like a meteor. They just come down because the balloon started running out of air. They actually don't even land that hard. Most of them are still intact, still working when they land. Sorry, I digress. Okay. Um, do you believe in um, the ice wall around the uh, Earth? I do, but I don't like the name as much. I, I know that people are really big on the whole ice wall thing because of the whole Game of Thrones, you know, that whole thing. Winter is coming. Um, but for me, the ice wall, you know, remember when we say the ice wall, we're just talking about the Antarctic coastline. The real meat of it is when you go inland because Antarctica, even as science describes it, is the most unique continent out there meaning most of it is a plateau at 7,000 feet high at least, or maybe even more of that, maybe 10,000 feet. I can't remember exactly, uh, but it's way, it's above altitude sickness and it goes up to 20,000 feet in some places. So we, and it, it continues inland. So the, the ice wall is just the beginning. The Antarctic coastline, just if you're talking about where you would have, how far inland you would have to go before you hit the barrier, the wall, you know, the edge of this snow globe, probably several thousand miles, at least. I mean, the United States and the Soviet Union were tr basically trying to do it from 1928 all the way up until about 1956 with better and better planes. They were flying out there and flying and flying and flying. And eventually in 1956, we believe that they found it. So let's say that you were able to go through those few thousand miles. What's the end point? What happens when you reach that end point? Uh, that's one of the big questions. Is, gravity. Well, yeah, if, if it was me, I mean, is it, you know, when you reach the edge, you know, when you reach the barrier, let's say the, the wall of this place, what, what exactly are you looking at? I mean, dealer's choice. Are, are you looking at a, a heavy element, uh, electromagnetic frequency, a unified field, heavy water? Uh, maybe if it was me, I would treat it no different than what we do in the simulation world. I would throw in negative physics. I don't know, you know, if, if you guys ever game, if you run to the edge of the map, what happens? You're running, but you're not going anywhere. You know, you, you literally can't, you literally can't move forward. Uh, negative physics goes against you, uh, at least in the simulation, and you're just not allowed to even touch the outer barrier. It's, it's there, but you can't get there. And even with the barrier, not seeing what's on the other side, let's say if you were to dig a hole completely underground, to the point of no return, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like people that believe in a round spherical earth, they have the core, they have, and let's say when you dig somewhere, you go into the complete opposite in, in the earth, or what's the make out of uh, the lithosphere? Oh, no, no, that's that's a great question. And I, I love it when people ask this. In fact, it was in my clues. I don't know if you had a chance to watch it, which is people say, well, you know, in fact, I had this question yesterday. It's like, well, what's what, what's underneath? You know, what, if you dig down on a flat earth, what happens? You know, kind of like the, the the impossible Minecraft scenario. When you dig down, what what what, what can you reach the, the the bottom of Minecraft? 
Um, we don't know because even globalists don't know. Meaning, if you see, you know, we've all seen the cross sections, right? 4,000 miles to the center of the Earth, right? The Earth is 8,000 miles wide, 4,000 miles to the center. And we've all seen the, the pretty cross sections with red and orange and yellow and white bands. But the deepest hole ever drilled is what? Is it half that? 2,000 miles? 1,000 miles? 100 miles? It's not even 10 miles. The deepest hole ever drilled is 8 miles. After that, they cannot go any deeper. For whatever reason, the Russians and the Germans tried it for years, tried to break the eight mile barrier, although, you know, and if you're metric 12 kilometers, uh, and they couldn't do it. So why not? And if, if you can't go past eight miles, then what are all the drawings of the inside of the earth look like? Why do are those perfect 1000 mile bands? They have no idea. In fact, you go on wiki, you can look up stuff where the geologists will say, oh yeah, we have no idea what's down there. And so my question is, why, why don't you put a giant, instead of the earth with the cross sections, why don't you put a giant question mark in the middle of the earth? Science doesn't do that. They want to come off as to being as credible as possible. It's like, well, it's our best guess and our best guess is better than you. So we're going to say it's this, even though they have no idea what's down there. So do we know? Nope. But neither do you. And uh, <laughs> how's that? that? That's very true. That's very true. Um, one more question, um, sure. and this is more of an extreme hypothetical. Uh, what do you think has got us to where we are now? What do you think has brought us here, and what do you think is out there, out of the our list, out, out of our atmosphere, our lithosphere, everything? What do you think started it all? You mean okay? So what you mean like how did life exist? How did how how did this how did this place get built? How is yeah, how is it built? Well. That's, again, it's one of the bigger questions, like, like anything. I mean, it's no different than the cosmology uh, question that science asks, which is, okay, I know that science will go back and say, well, we can track all the way back to the Big Bang. And, of course, they get stuck. It's like, well, what happened before the Big Bang? It's like, nothing. <laughs> it's like, okay, that, that's fine. Um, ours is a lot more simple, which is if it is a snow globe, if it is a pizza box, if it is a you know terrarium, planetarium, then just by default, its shape means that it was built by something, uh, deliberately by something, which means there was some sort of creator. At that point, you can only go down one of two paths. Are we talking about an advanced civilization that's much older and much more powerful than ourselves? Or are we talking about the religious divine? You know, basically God, you know, in Santa Claus in a bathrobe on a Sunday morning, big white bathrobe uh take your pick it's one it's either one of one of those two things because it has to be one of those two things because we didn't build it so at that point you know you're, you're talking about uh, one step closer to finding out the meaning of life and our purpose which is one is the big reason why flat earth is resonated so much and because we say that you're not just some little rock that can be snuffed out by anything from gamma rays to a black hole to you know a rogue comet at any given time you you are this little box that's just sitting somewhere uh and it was made deliberately just for you and there isn't this is empty cosmos it, the the place is very deliberate and it gives a lot of people a, a reason it gives them purpose uh gives them hope and that's that's why it just keeps growing bigger and bigger well, thank you so much, Mr. Sergeant. Really, really appreciate this taking yeah. your time out to help us with our presentation. Um, hope you're successful for the rest of um, the society. Yeah. Um, have a good day. All right. Have a good weekend. All of that. Uh, thank you so much again. Thanks, guys. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.